I, I recognize myself for an opening statement for five minutes. Um, Chairman Waxman is there. Is there? Bobby, come on. Today's hearing is the seventh in a series of our American Energy Initiative. It is also the second hearing in which we will examine a discussion draft entitled the Jobs and Ener Energy Permitting Act of 2011, which has been authored by our colleague, Mr. Gardner of Colorado. Our first hearing on the discussion draft enabled the committee to receive testimony from the entire Alaskan congressional delegation, citizens and state officials in Alaska, two clean air experts, and the University of Alaska economist. In, the fir in, in that first hearing, we were unable to secure a witness from the U U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. But today, we have an assistant administrator, Gina McCarthy, from the Office of Air and Radi Radiation, as well as other state government officials with unique perspectives on the draft legislation. We are glad to host these witnesses and look forward to the discussion. While our witness panel today is different from the one on April 13th, the facts in, the Ala in Alaska remain the same as they, are four as they were four weeks ago. Up to 27 billion barrels of oil and 122 trillion cubic feet of natural gas are estimated to reside in Alaska's offshore fields. Beginning in 2005, the Federal Government initiated lease sales in an attempt to get this oil and natural gas to the U.S. consumers. But instead, exploration companies have yet to drill a single hole in the Beaufort and the Chickakee Seas, I never can say that, after EPA's regulatory roadblocks have delayed any activity for nearly five years. This is an unprecedented process for drilling in America's coastal waters. Many permits in the Gulf of Mexico are issued in a matter of weeks and, at most, a matter of months. No bureaucratic delays in the Federal Government concerning offshore drilling come anywhere close to the five-year drilling companies, five years drilling companies have experienced with the EPA. Indeed, this process is slower than anywhere else in the world, and it is negatively impacting our energy security. The seemingly endless jungle of red tape created by the Environmental Appeals Board would almost be funny if it weren't so sad. With gasoline prices mounting another destructive attack on, Amer on the American economy, unrest in the Mideast and North Africa, reminding us how vulnerable we are to supply shocks and declining throughput in the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System, posing a threat to pipeline safety and the Alaska economy, one would think getting Arctic production online would be an imperative for the U.S. government. On that last point, every one of the witnesses at our last hearing agreed the shutdown of the TAPS would be, a disastrous, be as disastrous for the state of Alaska and the U.S. energy security. I simply do not see how we can prevent such an event from taking place if we do not open new areas of production in the Alaskan North Slope. The discussion draft circula circulated by Mr. Gardner is a common sense modification to the Clean Air Act that will right the ship at the EPA so, that Amer so, Amer so new American sources of energy will come online in an environmentally responsible manner. It will end the un unnecessary bureaucratic quagmire and ensure communities on the Alaskan North Slope will be protected from air pollution associated with offshore drilling. With that, I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Gardner to speak further on the draft legislation. Mr. Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing today and to Administrator McCarthy for being here and the witnesses. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think everyone in this room can agree that we've got to do something about high gas prices, and that's a big part of what this hearing and the American Energy Initiative is about, along with energy security and ensuring that the American economy can withstand turmoil in the Middle East and any potential disruption to our oil supply from abroad. We can all agree we've, we want to do that. Uh, even the President has said uh, that he wants to achieve energy security and do something about gas prices. What I don't understand is the lack of action being taken by the administration on something that is so important to the American people and so vital to the strength of our economy in general. And that is part of the reason I plan to introduce the Jobs and Energy Permitting Act of 2011. Uh, this bill doesn't relate just to Alaska. It has to do with every American who is forced to suffer through pain at the pump. Exploration in Alaska will generate federal revenue and create tens of thousands of jobs for the rest of the country while lowering gas prices at the same time. The President recently said there is no silver bullet that can bring down gas prices right away, and I would agree with him. However, I do not believe that the administration is using all the tools it has at its disposal to even begin to reduce the amount we are paying right now. 
My bill, however, would take a major first step in doing so. It would end the practice of stalling air permits from being administered after the EPA has approved them. Uh, that's, that's exactly what's happened. In the case of the shell permit we're all discussing, the EPA, administrated, uh, it, the EPA administered the permit and then got caught up in a mess of reviews and appeals. And five years later, they still aren't drilling off the coast of Alaska. We moved the permitting process along by removing the ability of the Environmental Appeals Board to hold up air permits for offshore OCS rigs. It's absolutely astonishing that the Department of Interior can issue a permit in less than a month in many cases, while the process in Alaska can take years simply because of this one unelected board, a board with no parallel at the Department of Interior. Uh, I, I, we have got to act now uh, to help relieve the pain at the pump, and I hope we can move forward on this legislation. Delay is inexcusable. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And now I would like to recognize the ranking member, uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all, uh, the witnesses, for being present here today. Mr. Chairman, today marks the second hearing on the so called Jobs and Energy Permitting Act of 2011, which will amend Section 328 of the Clean Air Act that addresses air pollution from outer continental shelf OCS drilling activities. Fortunately, uh, Mr. Chairman, in today's hearing, we will hear from the EPA directly to clear up any misunderstanding or confusion on the current permitting process and also to hear how this bill would affect uh, that process if it were to become law. The staffs of the majority and minority have been meeting to try to work out a bipartisan compromise on this bill, and I hold out hope that we will be able to move forward uh, to, in a collaborative way. I have said on several occasions that I am not opposed to streamlining the permitting pro process, provided that we allow for appropriate community input and we do not weaken the air quality controls that the licensing process was implemented to protect. One of my main concerns with this bill is the impact of eliminating the local administrative appeals process and moving the entire appellate process all the way here to Washington, D.C. I find it particularly worrisome that this bill will eliminate the right of administrative appeal for everyone except the drilling company. It seems to me that forcing state and local stakeholders to travel all the way to the U.S. Court of Appeals here in Washington in order to air their grievances would provide an unreasonable burden on less affluent communities and stakeholders. <coughs> I'm also e eager to hear from the EPA on the provision in the bill that will allow the drilling companies, companies rather, to look at <coughs> look only at how the drilling would affect our, our air quality on shore, ignoring any potential impacts to air quality between the drilling rig and the shoreline. Additionally, I have some concerns over exempting support vessels from VACT back and prevention of significant deterioration or PSD permitting requirements <coughs> and the effect this may have on local air quality. I look forward to hearing from these witnesses on, these, uh, on the impact these provisions may have on air quality standards. While I understand that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle <coughs> want to help Shell begin dr drilling in Alaska's Beaufort and Chukchi season, uh, sea regions, it is important that we do not enact legislation that will have significant consequences in the law of 48, uh, whether intended or unintended. And right now, as the bill is drafted, there are still significant concerns on this side of the aisle that this bill will do exactly that. In fact, I've read that Shell representatives 
met with the Obama administration officials earlier uh, this week, and they were assured that they will receive the necessary permits to begin exploration in Alaska fairly soon. So hopefully uh, this issue can be settled without an act of Congress intervening on behalf of uh, a single corporation. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and our experts on this important issue. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, sir. And now uh, you are recognized the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Assistant Administrator, welcome. Uh, we uh, spent time on the phone with Congressman Costello, Congressman Whitfield, and myself on uh, the Prairie State campus. Um, it's good to see Laura back there hiding in the back. Uh, we miss seeing her up here, but hopefully you're putting her to good use. The, um, uh, a couple things. I want to submit for the record uh, this article that came out May 9th. I know my ranking member, Mr. Rush, always teases me about the coal miner poster that I put up all the time. Well, this is a good story. Um, coal plant to hire 200 more workers. And actually, that first par paragraph says about half of the 300 miners and coal miners operators who have been hired at the Prairie State Energy Campus in rural Washington County are at work in the new mine, and another 200 employees will be hired to operate the new power plant and corporate offices. So I'm going to submit that for the record. And that goes into the discussion that we've had before. Um, the Prairie State has 1,600 megawatts, super critical new power plant. It's about 75 percent completed. Uh, it was moved based upon the premise of under care. Uh, we're moving because of the court case. We're moving to the transport rule, uh, and they are. We've had some positive discussions. They're not completed, and I appreciate those uh, th that effort uh, that we're doing to try to get some clarity. But the real concern is there's not going to be enough credits under under the transport rule, where this 1,600 megawatt new power plant, which is I think where everybody wants to go, newer technology, cleaner technology. I'm not a I'm not a climate change guy, but I am the toxic emission side of the air. And this is by far, uh, unless you talk about gasification, the direction we want. This is what we want to incentivize. Uh, our calculations say that because of it, um, they may be only to turn the plant on about 30 percent if the if the credits that we think will get passed on to the power plant gets passed on. Um, obviously, this is a public power plant. Uh, it's not a evil corporate for-profit entity. It's got local municipalities, lo local regional power companies, uh, municipalities, counties, and the like. So I hope we can continue to have those discussions and, and conversations, especially with the stakeholders. And this, those stakeholders also consist of, uh, uh, of course, members of the organized labor who help building build this new power plant. So. Um, with that, uh, I also uh, am very supportive of us moving forward in a timely manner to get certainty to people who are investing a lot of capital to get a decision of whether we can move forward on more oil and gas exploration recovery. So thank you for appearing. I'd like to yield the remainder of the time to my colleague from Texas, Mr. Burgess. I thank the, thank the gentleman for yielding. Administrator McCarthy, again, welcome back to our committee. I'm way over here on the far right. Um, <laughs> as far to the right from Mr. Waxman as I can get. Um, I want to thank you for coming back to our committee. I know we've had several discussions and, and uh, may even bring up some of the things that we've discussed in the past, but this morning we are focused on the fact that our, our, our nation's path to energy security appears to be veering grossly off track, and that appears to have occurred over the last two years. This administration has done everything, literally everything in its power to hamper the growth of the energy sector of our economy, preventing domestic production of thousands of resources literally underneath our feet. Under the guise of safety, the Department of Interior, along with the EPA's blessing, has slow walked permitting for thousands of sites on federal lands and offshore that could, could put us on the path to lowering our dependence on foreign oil. Although much of America's attention has been focused on the Gulf of Mexico recently, the Arctic region has seen a severe hindrance to permits to drill in areas where the water depth can be as shallow as 150 feet, nowhere close to the 5,000-foot depth where the deep water drilling uh, incident occurred in the Gulf. 
Yet these permits off the Alaska coast are being held up because of events taking place at deep water sites. In areas of the globe with only a handful of people, the EPA is holding up permits due to so-called human health risks. These are dangerous and costly delay tactics and they must stop. We know this country has an untold amount of natural resources, but for bureaucratic red tape, we could be producing. This subcommittee has already heard testimony that oil and gas jobs pay more and are longer lasting than the so-called green jobs, which are temporary. This administration is preventing people from getting back to work producing domestic energy. I look forward to hearing the testimony of all of our witnesses today, and I certainly look forward to uh, producing legislation that help us move this permitting process forward and allow companies to begin hiring Americans and producing American energy from American resources. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. And I recognize now the gentleman from California, Ranking Member Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by thanking you for t uh, holding today's hearing. We held a hearing last month on how air quality permits are issued for oil and gas activities on the outer continental shelf. Today's hearing will let us hear from EPA and State officials, the people who administer the current air quality protections, about this issue. These are the uh, air quality experts who carry out the Clean Air Act and would have to implement any changes we make. Their views are critical to informed decision making and I hope we listen closely to their advice. At our first hearing, we heard testimony from Shell Oil about the problems they encountered obtaining an air permit in Alaska. And I agree with our chairman that the permitting process in Alaska has taken too long and that appropriate clarifications in the Clean Air Act could be helpful. It is important to recognize, however, that Shell's experience in Alaska doesn't reflect the vast majority of OCS permitting experience. California has been successfully carrying out its program for almost 20 years, and the California process is not broken. My concern is that while the draft, while the draft bill that the subcommittee is considering may help fix some problems in Alaska, it is not an appropriate solution for California, and some provisions would have harmful effects on the whole program. According to the testimony we will hear today, the current draft bill would undermine California's air quality protections, actually make it harder for California to issue defensible permits and impose substantial cost burdens on the state. That makes no sense. I refuse to believe that we can't address some of the specific problems Shell points to without creating much bigger problems elsewhere. That is why I have offered to work with the majority on this legislation to come up with a proposal that would address specific problems without breaking what is working well. I can't support the bill in its current form, but I do think we could reach agreement on something that would address the concerns Shell has raised. As the committee considers this legislation, there are a few key areas that are particularly troubling. First, I don't think that encouraging more litigation makes any sense. But that is what the bill does by largely eliminating administrative appeals and forcing almost everyone to go straight to court. The current administrative re review process at EPA's Environmental Appeals Board is faster, simpler, and far less costly than going to court. You don't need to hire a lawyer. The Board can skip oral arguments. And, and if it allows for or oral argument, it is done through video conferencing. The EAB's permit decisions are rarely challenged and almost always upheld by the appellate courts. In fact, this process works so well that the legislation preserves administrative appeals, but only for the permit application. If an administrative process is good enough that Shell wants to keep it for its appeals, it is only fair that we keep it for everyone else. Equal access to justice is a fundamental principle of our system. I am surprised the majority would even consider abrogating that. It also makes no sense to force all of these local permitting cases to be heard in Washington, D.C. A longstanding system and extensive case law governs how judicial venue is to be determined. The Clean Air Act judicial review provisions are consistent with these principles, sending local and regional matters to the Court of Appeals for the appropriate circuit. But this proposal would carve out a special exception for a narrow class of cases. Finally, 
The committee should distinguish between changes necessary to clarify and streamline the process and changes that are really aimed at weakening air quality protections. Shell told us they don't want to weaken the law. They just want to know what they have to do. If that is the case, we could certainly provide clarifications and speed up the process without weakening air quality protections. But many of the changes in the law proposed to be made by the current draft have the effect of weakening protections. If the goal here is really to let Shell and other oil companies get out of clean air requirements, that is something I would strongly oppose. I look forward to exploring these issues in today's hearing and once again thank the Chairman for proceeding with today's uh, hearing itself. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Now we are going to move to our panelist and our first panelist today is Mr. Chairman. Could is, is time expired for all opening statements? Yes, sir. It is. Great. Sorry about that. We moved our first panelist. It will be uh, Ms. Gina McCarthy, Assistant Administrator, Office of Air and Radiation, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we welcome you here today. Thank you so much for coming. And you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Sullivan. Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, on the discussion draft of the Jobs and Energy Permitting Act of 2011. The President's blueprint for a secure energy future recognizes the importance of producing domestic oil safely and responsibly, while also taking steps to reduce our dependence on oil by leveraging cleaner alternative fuels and greater energy efficiency. We have already made progress towards these objectives. Last year, America produced more oil than we had since 2003. We also announced groundbreaking fuel efficiency standards for cars and trucks. Over the life of the vehicles, these standards will conserve 1.8 billion barrels of oil and save thousands of dollars for the owners of these vehicles. Applications for OCS permits have increased in the last few years, largely as a result of exploratory drilling activities, particularly in the Arctic. Permitting these activities can be complex due to a variety of drilling equipment and support vessels as well as the challenges of operating in a climate that is very different than the Gulf of Mexico. The, the President's blueprint established an across-agency team to facilitate a more efficient offshore permitting process in Alaska while ensuring that safe, safety, health and environmental standards are fully complied with. EPA participates in this team. My comments on the bill are grounded in the administration's support for a common sense approach to OCS development that balances the need to explore for and produce energy with the need to protect public health and the environment in the surrounding areas. Most importantly, I am concerned that the draft bill would mute voices of concerned citizens about matters that affect their communities. For example, currently, if a group of subsistence fishermen were concerned that an EPA permit didn't adequately address the effect of the health of air pollution from nearby drilling rigs, they could appeal the decision to the Environmental Appeals Board. They would not be required to hire a lawyer. They wouldn't have to attend oral arguments. They could, they could participate through video conference. They would know that their concerns are being heard by experts. The bill would instead force appeals into a court system and one that is not even the closest U.S. Court of Appeals. Alaska fishermen would either need to hire a D.C. attorney or fly a local attorney all the way to D.C. The Board's decision may be challenged in court, which may lead you to assume that the Board's review prolongs the permit process. But experience really tells us otherwise. The Board is cheaper, faster, and more expert substitute for the Federal Court. On average, the Board decides PSD appeals in just over five months from the filing of the appeal, much faster than judicial courses are resolved, judicial cases are resolved. And in almost all cases, the Board decision resolves the dispute, avoiding protracted Federal Court review. Since 92, only four of the Board's 100 PSD permit decisions have been reviewed by a Federal Court, and not one of them has been overturned. It is unclear how it would serve the public's interest to increase Federal Court litigation in D.C. and deprive the citizens of a cheaper, faster way of resolving their grievances. I would also like to raise briefly several considerations relevant to the Drafts Bill's substantive changes to Section 328. 
First, exploration and drilling activities in the OCS can emit substantial amounts of pollution. During the 168-day uh, Arctic OCS drilling season, one exploratory OCS source could emit approximately as much on a daily basis as a large state-of-the-art refinery. Second, human exposure to pollution from OCS sources does not stop at the shoreline. Substantial human activity occurs between the shoreline and the state seaward boundaries and in some areas may extend into the OCS. Failure to control OCS sources adequately may result in the need for more expensive onshore controls. It was this problem off the coast of California that led Congress to require OCS sources to obtain Clean Air Act permits in the first place. In closing, EPA supports the use of an efficient permitting process to develop domestic energy supplies safely and responsibly. Our responsibility is to protect the health of Americans, but we know we must do so with common sense measures that also allow us to strengthen our domestic energy supply. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Ms. McCarthy. And we will now open it up for questioning uh, questions. And I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, in your testimony, you cited the President's blueprint for secure energy future and a supposed commitment to producing domestic oil. The insulting thing is, is that you take credit for current production rates, stating that we have already made progress towards these objectives. Last year, America produced more oil than we had since 2003. Are you really taking credit for current domestic production when those projects took years to develop? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am, I am simply stating a fact that production is, is uh, equal to 2003. EPA takes no credit for anything other than to, in, an attempt to work with, with uh, Shell and others to expeditely move those permits forward. Ms. McCarthy, can you name one significant project that the Obama administration supported that would increase the production of oil? And is the Alaskan Arctic permitting fiasco an example of that kind of work, handiwork? Mr. Sullivan, let me just, just challenge a little bit back at you that I, I don't think there has been a fiasco in the shell permitting, and I would like to clarify that, if I may. Um, there, there were statements made that, that we have taken five years to permit uh, shell, to address shell permits and they are still not in place. In fact, every time Shell has, has applied for a permit, a permit has been issued by the agency within three to six months you think of that permit application being complete. But you, you don't think five years for a permit is not a fiasco? There, is, there is, has never been five years to a permit decision by Shell. We have reached or a permit decision and, they have a, and many of those decisions have been appealed. Shell has consistently revised the request, changed the project, well, changed well, what sea no they final. wanted to drill in. And now I think we are very close to an understanding between us and Shell about where their opportunity is, how they can structure their permit, and how we can deliver a solid permit for them in a short time. There hasn't been any final agency action for five years. Uh, th there are many reasons for that, not least of which is that for three years Shell sought to, to obtain a minor source permit for a very large source of Do you think that is too long, pollution. though? Would you agree that that is too long? I, I don't agree that it has been five years with the same permit, Mr. Chairman. That is the only point I am trying to make. Each time the permit has been revised and we have effectively issued a permit. But what about the agency final action hasn't happened? I mean, that is taken. You that is that's correct. That is correct. Many of the permits have been withdrawn. Many of them have been changed. Many of the, in the most recent ones, there were two that were remanded by the EAB. We are working through those issues in a collaborative way, and we expect a well, solid permit. A lot of these soon. companies that you talk to, one can't get through, but when they do, they are told to redo things, do this. Re, you know, it just seems like a real game you are playing with them. Uh, in the private sector, they don't deal with that kind of stuff when they are out there. They people make decisions and quickly, and, 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 and they do every, they check every box, but they, it seems to take a very long time. I think that, uh, that we are trying to work very effectively with the project developer to get a permit for the project they are developing. If their parameters change and their interests change, we try to, to adjust to that. Um, I will tell you that that is one of the reasons why the President has pulled together an interagency group to ensure that all of the permits are done um, as expeditiously as possible and, and, uh, uh, and we can get these permits accomplished um, in a collaborative way. Um, the agency itself is also looking at how the permit standards for these permits in the Arctic 
uh, relate to the permits we're issuing in the Gulf of Mexico right. in doing our best um, to move those forward. Well, you say here that you, you we have, uh, in your statement, you say we have already made progress towards these objectives. Could you name some of the progress you've made? I'm sorry, which objectives are you referring to, Mr. Chairman? Well, you say here that, uh, you say we have already, okay, it says, uh, let me get to the slide. It says on March 30th, the President released a blueprint. We also are taking steps to reduce our dependence on oil wherever it comes from by leveraging cleaner alternative fuels and greater <coughs> energy efficiency. We have already made is your, we have already made progress towards these objectives. Last year, America produced more oil than we had since 2003. What were the progresses that you've made towards these objectives? Well, let me, if I might, let me be a little bit parochial and say what EPA has accomplished um, because I think it's significant. Um, we mentioned in my testimony the light duty vehicle rule, which will actually well, save 1.8 well, billion. I'm kind of talking about domestic oil production in regards to domestic oil production. In domestic oil production, we, we have, uh, I, I do not have specific examples I can offer you. All I can say is when EPA uh, is working with refineries. I understand, I understand what you are saying. Why would you mention it in your opening statement then? I actually think I was referring to the light duty vehicle rule when we are talking both about production well, as well as yeah. reducing dependency on oil, which includes reducing 1.8 billion barrels of oil dependency as a result of the light duty vehicle rule. Well, that, 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 I, I, I guess we'll agree to disagree because it's not okay. what you have in your statement. Um, okay, and I, and I thank you very much. I'd now like to yield to uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Ranking Member Rush, for five. Or, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, have a, a article here uh, dated uh, 5-11-2011 uh, from uh, Greenwire, uh, like unanimous consent to enter into the record. No, I, I, do, I do have a question. I have an article uh, here. Uh, oh, without uh, objection. I'm sorry. I wouldn't apologize. Okay. <coughs> uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, uh, the goal of the Clean Air Act is to protect public health and welfare from harm from uh, air pollution. And the bill that we're discussing today will change the way EPA and states can address pollution from offshore drilling. Some have argued that this bill is just about streamlining the permitting process. And I want to make sure that the proposed changes don't do harm to the public health and to the public welfare. One provision in the bill will allow the drilling companies to look at how the drilling will affect air quality onshore, ignoring any potential impacts to air quality between the drilling rig and the shoreline. Uh, does the EPA have concerns that this change will allow health impacts to be ignored <coughs> offshore? Uh, Ms. Rush, there is uh, substantial human activity off the shoreline, as we all know, mm -hmm. which means there is a potential, um, should this bill go through as proposed, of substantial human exposure to air pollution, in particular between the area of the shoreline and the state seaward boundary. So Native Alaskans uh, who breathe that air uh, would be potentially harmed while they are fishing or whaling? Is that what you say? That is correct. Okay. It's been, uh, with the chairman, you have had some discussions uh, regarding uh, the delay uh, and you maintain that, that Shell has uh, <coughs> resubmitted uh, applications. They move the uh, goal line. Uh, they keep moving the goalposts further and further away and keep changing the goalposts. Would you care to elaborate more on what you were trying to uh, express? Yes, I, I would, Mr. Rush. Uh, EPA, uh, oh, since, uh, 90, since 1990 and 92, uh, has been moving forward with processing these permits in a timely way. We have processed 13 permits. Mm -hmm. Each of those has been done within three to six months of the permit application being complete. 
Some of those since 92 have been referred mm -hmm. to the Environmental Appeals Board, but the Appeals Board itself processes its appeals on average within a five-month period. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it provides the public an opportunity to be heard, but it also provides an expedited way to ensure that that permit is as strong as it needs to be. During that five-year period, the initial three-year period, Shell changed its mind about where it wanted to drill, the types of vessels it would use, the type of project it wanted to pursue. We have consistently worked with them and issued new permits in a timely way. The good news is that I believe that we are very close to a strong permit that will allow them to have actually three drilling operations going on in, in the Arctic in a way that is protective of public health and consistent with current law. Uh, so, so you, in your opinion, then we will. This process is going to come to an end, and it hasn't been the fault of the EPA. This has been uh, the responsibility of the company changing uh, its uh, its plan. It is, but I, I'm not trying to blame Shell any right. more than I think at this Absolutely. point Shell's trying to blame us. Right. Th these are very difficult projects to pursue, right. particularly in Alaska. It's even more difficult right. because of the the weather, because of the, all of the different technologies you need, the ice breakers, the emergency response. We have little air quality monitoring data. There are hurdles that you need to go through, but we're getting better and better. And as these permits get issued. The, the, that it will lay a foundation for the ones that follow. And is your opinion that Shell is satisfied, really, with the uh, process as, as it's been as it's, uh, taking place, and they're not at odds at all with the EPA in, in terms of this? And I think they believe that the permits, the three permits that we're processing now, will be very valuable to them. I think they recognize that they're going to be solid legally because they have been tested through the EAB. And history has shown us that once the EAB reviews a project and, and makes a decision, that, it, that it's a very solid ground for that, pro for that permit moving forward in terms of any subsequent court challenge, which almost never follows. Yeah, we're, uh, we're all concerned about the timeliness of these uh, permits in, the, in this process, but I just want to caution uh, all of us that, you know, in this instance, we have to get it right. Haste does make waste uh, uh, in this particular instance. And the fact is, is that the public health and welfare is uh, solidly at stake. And so we need to uh, do our due diligence. And I think that any reasonable uh, person would uh, agree and understand that these things do take time. We don't want EPA rushing to issue permits for oil drilling, uh, no matter who the company is or where it's located, located at. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Rush. And now I'll recognize a uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McCarthy, I need to go off topic here for a mm -hmm. moment because our opportunity to talk, as much as I cherish the, the opportunities, we. We don't get to talk that often. And it was about a year ago that you came to a briefing called by Mr. Markey uh, to talk to <coughs> us off the record about some of the activities that were going on as a result of an energy policy that was passed by the Congress, signed by the President in December 2007, dealing with the mandate for blending ethanol into the nation's gasoline supply. You recall that? that yes. That we had that I day? do. And I had a number of questions about the type of testing that had been done and mm -hmm. where it had been done. It's been extremely difficult for me to get answers on that. I understand. I asked many of those questions to Lisa Jackson when she was here, Administrator Jackson, when she was here in February, and my understanding is those answers came yesterday to the committee, but uh, they've not been shared with, with me yet. But let me just ask you again about where we are, because I, there are a lot of questions out there from people about what is happening with the amount of ethanol in the nation's gasoline supply and the safety of that, um, wh where is the agency right now as far as being able to, uh, wh wh where are you in the process of studying this? Where are you in the process of rulemaking with this? What are people to expect uh, this summer as they crank up their lawnmowers and weed eaters and mantis tillers? What are they to expect? from the performance of their engines with this additional uh, ethanol? 
Well, first, let me, let me be very clear. E15 is right now not on the market. Um, there are a number of decisions that need to be made before uh, it can be in the fuel supply. So. Uh, let, let me but back I'm just going to interrupt you for a second because yeah. although uh, E15 was not mandated, what Congress did to you, uh, I was against this when it happened, yep. but it mandated that a certain volume of ethanol be incorporated into the nation's gasoline supply and utilized by, by I forget, 2015 or 2020. But in order to meet that blend requirement, it is going to require a higher percentage of ethanol in the nation's gasoline supply, is it not? It, it actually required renewable fuel, so not in particular ethanol. Um, and it, in that, the requirement was a 2022 for 36 million um, gallons uh, to be replaced uh, you, with renewable fuels. So it, I don't think the impetus for E15 was necessarily that 36 million figure. Um, we actually are required under law to entertain waiver requests which look at whether or not a fuel should be allowed to happen um, and to be allowed to be brought into the market on the basis of whether or not it is going to pose significant air pollution problems or challenges to the air pollution control equipment that are on vehicles or engines. And we received such a request on E15. DOE did do significant testing, and we did it on uh, the newer vehicles, which is 2001 and newer vehicles, because those uh, vehicles yeah, have. Me, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, actually, I have a letter from Secretary Chu from the Department of Energy, February 18th, and he said you all were doing the testing. And this is one of the problems I get into is this circuitous. Oh, uh, uh, discussion between I, you and I the can other. look at that and, and clarify for you, but D right. DOE did the significant amount of testing. Manufacturers did testing as well that we are privy to, and we looked at the full range of testing available to us. The bottom line was there was sufficient testing to indicate that E15 could be used in 2001 in newer vehicles. We are right now looking at a fuel registration application. That means we are looking at health consequences associated with E15. We are about ready to make a determination on that. The agency still has to develop a final guidance on what that means for underground storage tanks and dispensing units. And individual states need to make certification uh, decisions. Well, so there is, there is a lot happening between here and there. We also have a final rule that we have to get out that looks yeah. at how to prevent misfueling. Let and that me, uh, package will be out shortly. Let me reclaim my time because it is about to run out. Uh, let me just say it is all great. That is the theory. Let me tell you the application, the application from Lowry's Lawnmower Repair last Monday when I had a, an impromptu town hall at, uh, at where I was getting my lawnmower fixed. And they said, <laughs> this is great for business. I asked them about ethanol, the, of course, the existing levels of ethanol. He said, it is great for business. We get to rebuild so many of these little engines that it is just keeping us, uh, it is like the President's own jobs program. They have to keep hiring <laughs> people to fix, people like me, to fix their, their lawnmowers. And this is the problem that people all over this country are encountering. And I encourage you to be on top of this and not be, try to play catch up. I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burris. Thank you. And uh, we have a long series of votes right now, so we are going to suspend the hearing until 11 o'clock or until the vote series is completed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. We will call this, me, this uh, committee hearing back to order. And I now recognize myself for five minutes uh, uh, for Mrs. McCarthy. Ms. McCarthy, just a couple of quick questions for you. Thank you for, for uh, your time and patience in waiting for this, uh, the vote series to be over. And uh, everybody else, I appreciate your time. Uh, do you believe in fossil fuel energy development? Yes. Uh, do you believe we should utilize the energy we have here in the United States? Yes. Do you believe the United States should be energy secure by using our own energy? I believe we should enhance energy security any way we can. Do you believe Alaska provides us an opportunity to move us toward energy security? Uh, I believe that that's, that is clearly the intent of the President, is to utilize domestic supplies as much as we can and, and ensure that public health is protected as we do it. Do you believe the efforts on this matter before us have achieved this goal? Uh, I believe Chuck we're- Chuck in Beaufort seat. I think we're, we're uh, on a path to success. Yes, I do. Five years delay. You believe we're on a five uh, path to success? I actually think it's been five years of, of uh, discussion with Shell where things have changed considerably. But I think at this point we have three permits um, that I feel very confident that we can issue and that will be legally defensible and protective as well. 
Do you agree or disagree with Administrator Jackson's previous testimony to the Senate Appropriations <coughs> Committee in the context of the Shell Arctic Air Permits where she said, and I quote, I believe that the analysis will clearly show that there is no public health concern here, that it is quite likely these activities will not cause air pollution that will endanger health. I'm sorry, I don't know the context of that, that comment, so I, I can't really uh, respond to it, but I can say that I believe that we are on the path to issuing permits that will be protective of public health the way the Clean Air Act intends. So you're unfamiliar with uh, Administrator Jackson's testimony before uh, the Senate uh, committee, uh, among, it was uh, Senator J Murkowski's testimony, or actually questioning on uh, the issue of Alaska and the Beaufort Chuck GC? I certainly am aware that that happened. I don't know the direct context of that quote, but it seems perfectly reasonable to suggest that we can issue permits that are protective of public health, particularly the way in which Shell is now currently structuring them in their project. Uh, and the, the transcript right here says, it basically is a question, she talked about the lengthy permit process, uh, the mm -hmm. new requirements have taken place. And Administrator Jackson went on to say that the analysis will clearly show there is no public health concern here. Do you agree with that? Uh, we are completing the modeling analysis now, the way in which the EAB has requested it, and we feel pretty confident that that will prove the, uh, the administrators to have been absolutely correct. So you'd agree with the Administrator Jackson then? I would agree that, but I, I would just caution that we haven't yet written the permit uh, in response to the EAB, so I don't want to presume what that says. Did she misspeak then when she was saying no, that? No, I think she was system? talking in general the fact that we believe that we can write a permit that is protective of public health, and I think we will be doing that. In your testimony, you state that preventing uh, appeals to the EAB will limit opportunities for public comment. Are you aware that the public has an opportunity to comment with respect to any and all air environment, air and environment issues during a Department of Interior's five-year lease plan? I do. Uh, are you aware that the public has an opportunity to comment again with respect to any and all air and environment <laughs> issues during the regional planning environmental document? I, I am well aware that there is an opportunity to, to have comment in general, not about a specific source. And on this one, I'd just like to, there were public hearings in Nixut, Point Lay, Barrow, Kaktovic, Wainwright, Point Hope, uh, and that's just on in one area uh, of public comment. Uh, are you aware that the public has an opportunity to comment with respect to any and all air and, and environment issues again at the time of the lease sale? Uh, I'm not that familiar with the lease sale issues. I'm sorry. Well, they, they do. They do actually have the opportunity to comment. And surely you're aware that the public has an opportunity to comment with respect to uh, air permit itself when EPA Region 10 goes through its review process. We we actually provide that under the Clean Air Act. That's correct. And so are four rounds of public comment not sufficient? Uh, I don't believe that the question of whether or not EAB has a role in the process is really directly related to the amount of participation of the public. It is a question of how to handle appeals under the Clean Air Act and whether or not you want to account for that and provide that in a quick and easy way that the EAB does or whether you want to refer that directly but to I federal court. But I thought the court. EAB, that was one of the reasons you said the EAB was necessary was for public comment. Uh, it is because once the permit is, is finalized, it provides an opportunity for challenge of that permit to the EAB where they look at whether or not it has a sufficient well, you, you legal have a underpinnings. Well, there's final agency action. That's just another bite at the apple. Don't you think it's best to move this to the court so they can make a determination? I think that it's entirely up to folks whether or not they want to move it to court. I'm After not suggesting the court is, an, is inadequate. What I'm suggesting is that they are much more inefficient, they're much lengthier. They will, in fact, if they, if they take a year and a half and send it back, we'll be starting all over again. I think the EAB provides a service to us and to the agency to make sure that our permits are accurate, that they're technically correct, that they're legally defensible. And over time, the EAB has not been challenged in federal court successfully, so they have eliminated the need to go to a lengthy federal and expensive and so, and, and I ask this next question, I'm running out of time. Are you aware that in the central and western Gulf of Mexico, after the permit is issued, there is no appeals board? I am, I am aware that the appeal the public is can to just federal go to court. court and get it resolved. Mm -hmm. Is uh, that why the Gulf has been more efficient? And my, my actually, time is I, I, I want to be respectful okay. to uh, uh, my time, so I apologize for that. That's okay. Uh, Mr. Green, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, Ms. McCarthy, I. Uh, talked to you earlier. Thank you for not only being here today and taking, you know, for our vote schedule, but also being in Houston at the end of March, we, our subcommittee had a hearing on some of the battles we have in Texas, and I appreciate your time. Um, this suggested legislation we're working on, obviously, is, uh, uh, is interest, because I'm used to the Gulf of Mexico and Department of Interior rules, um, and so I'm learning a little bit about uh, 
uh, EPA's authority in, in on the other coast. In the Federal Register in 1991, EPA explicitly stated that the quote, the intent of Congress in adding Section 328 was to protect ambient air quality standards onshore and ensure compliance with PSD standards. EPA is to accomplish this by controlling emissions of a pollutants for which the ambient standards have been set and their precursors from the uh, OCS that can be transported onshore and affect ambient air. Um, why has there been a shift in the policy at the EPA where now you interpret Section 328 to mean you must re regulate the air impacts offshore? Uh, actually, uh, the way in which we are interpreting uh, our mission is to protect public health. Um, I think we were given clear direction in the Clean Air Act that that meant that we need to treat these offshore sources as if they were onshore because there is a great deal of human activity, in particular along the shoreline in the, in the, um, the state seaward boundary. And so we do actually uh, uh, apply the Clean Air Act, I think, as the law intended. Um, but we, we are looking at that in terms of differences that we would see between what is happening in the Arctic and the Gulf of Mexico and attempting to uh, apply that part of the rule in a way that is effective for public health protection, uh, but will still allow the permitting to occur in a, in a sensible way. During the last hearing, we heard testimony about ongoing litigation at the U.S. District Court here in the District of Columbia, which recently raised the issue of whether the EAB process must be completed within the overall one-year time limit under the Clean Air Act, within which the EPA must issue or deny a final prevention of significant deterioration permit. Can, do you agree that the EAB process should be completed within the overall one-year time limit? The position of the agency at this point, and this is actually being litigated, is that the 12-year, uh, the 12-month time limit refers to uh, complete, uh, the completion of the application uh, to the time when the region issues the permit. We do not believe that we are required to complete the EAB process in that timeline. However, I would point out that on these permits, we have completed the, the uh, between permit application and the region issuing a permit has been between three and six months, and on average, EAB only adds five months to that process. Okay. One of the criticisms of this bill is how it would define a source once drilling activities occurred, exactly like the BOE MRE defines the sources in the Gulf of Mexico. You mentioned how you believe that a source should be defined once anchor is down, but how does the EPA define a source of rigs? that are not attached to the ocean floor, such as a dynamically positioned one, one that doesn't have the anchor? Uh, well, actually, Region 4 is looking at that issue right now. My understanding is that Bomer looks at that issue as being a source when it actually enters into the lease area mm. because it is dynamically positioned instead of anchored. Um, we are looking at the same issue and likely to come out in the same way, but that permit has yet to be issued. Okay. The President's blueprint established a cross-agency team to, quote, facilitate a more efficient offshore permitting process in Alaska while ensuring that safety, health, and environmental standards are fully met. EPA participates in this team and has been established an interagency working group comprised of regional and headquarter permit experts to help expedite the resolution of the OCS air printing issues. What is the status of that group's work now? Uh, the, the work group was started um, oh, almost a year ago, and we are looking at the permits in the Arctic as well as the Gulf of Mexico, and we are looking at determinations that are consistent for where the point of compliance ought to be and how we make these decisions consistently. So it is very active. We are engaged in the presidential process to work with the other agencies, um, and we feel that the, the decisions we are about to make will, will be consistent uh, and will provide a standard for other permits that follow. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Back is time. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. McKinley for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and welcome back. Thank you. Um, I, er, in your opening remarks, and, and, and with my hearing issues, uh, maybe I didn't hear properly, but in your opening remarks, you referred to us, I believe, there you were concerned about the pollution from drilling rigs. Mm -hmm. Remember that comment? Yes. Um, what, what pollution from a drilling rig are you referring to? 
actually the pollution that's associated with the drilling rig itself, as well as the vessels that support that rig that are within a 25-mile radius. That is what the, the uh, Clean Air Act requires us to take a look at. It's substantial amounts of pollution. By virtue of them being there, so it's it's a lot. Well, it's the engines, it's the ships themselves as they sit stationary. So there are significant sources of emissions of 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 particulate matter, of sulfur dioxide, of nitrous oxide. There's significant amounts of pollution. Actually, commensurate with Ms. McCarthy, I'm still listening. We have the same quote. Uh, unfortunately, neither of us have the dates, and and I can't I can't pin you down on because I don't have the dates where. Lisa Jackson said there, there will be no. <coughs> I think she was referring to the fact that when, when our permit is complete and finalized, we'll have accounted for that pollution, minimized it in accordance with the Act, and ensure that the national ambient air quality standards are complied with at the point of compliance. And that is one of the issues that is, that is under debate um, in the, ru in the, uh, uh, the okay. law that you're I'm still, considering. I'm still struggling with that a little bit because I don't know how you're going to get there if you don't, if, if just the mere presence is going to be a pollutant, I don't know how then we're going to get there. Uh, if you just don't want us there. No, we, we actually treat it the exact same way as we treat onshore facilities. And we look to ensure that they are properly controlled and that they don't significantly impact air quality in the way in which the standard applies it. That does not mean that we can't issue permits on offshore the same way as we do onshore. Let me go back to it. I, I hesitate to ask you to submit to me something in writing or, uh, about it, because I'd like to know more about your position sure. on this, because back on May or uh, on March 1st, uh, when you appeared last before us, uh, we were talking about um, you're, you made a comment in your presentation, and several of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle said the same thing, and, and that was uh, subsidies for the coal industry. Um, and I, I challenged you on that uh, then, uh, and I continue to challenge. Uh, I asked then, and you said, I will send those to you. Uh, this is now May 13th. We have called your office, and you've not responded. We have emailed your office, and you haven't responded, and you haven't responded. We have no record of supporting your statement that coal is subsidized, and how. Uh, it is a, it's an, almost an arrogance here of using that term, and I don't understand where they're coming from because I go back to my district in West Virginia and ask coal companies about what their subsidy is, and none of them, to a person, to a company, none of them have any idea what you're talking about, but yet it is used as though it's gospel around here that the, that the coal companies are subsidized. I, I ask again, will you please put it in writing that companies are subsidized and in what vehicle? I'm happy to respond, and, and I, I do believe I remember the context of my comment, if you'd like me to explain it now. If not, we'll, I'm happy to do that. Writing. I want to have something. I'm tired. Everyone I, I, I don't think I was referring to financial. To back up what they're saying. Yeah, I don't think I was referring to financial subsidies. Subsidized. I want to know who it is because I don't want to see the coal companies subsidized. I don't want to see the lot of fossil fuel subsidized. I, I don't. I think this is a misrepresentation here with that. So I may be supportive, but I want to know which ones you're talking about, or is this just a hit again at fossil fuels coming from this administration? I don't believe that I was referring to a financial subsidy. I think that I was referring to the fact that many of the coal facilities are not required to meet toxic standards no, that, that other that. facilities are required to meet. Others in this panel have talked about that the coal industry is subsidized. I want to know specifically what do you mean? And if you're so, if you're back and off from your word, that's fine. I think that was the context that I was discussing oh, you the issue. Say that in context, but you don't remember what her context was. Everyone's got context. I was just please. Well, I was at the first one, not at the second one. <laughs> okay, just put it in writing if you. Okay. Would. Now, it's, it's been 10 we're, weeks. We're, ha we're happy to work with your staff, and I'll make sure that I get in you writing. the information that you're looking for. Thank you. Uh huh. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Shim Mr. Waxman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, the bill sets an extremely tight deadline for issuing an OCS permit just six months before the date a complete application is filed. 
I support a deadline, but this one may not be realistic and may sacrifice important elements of the process, such as public participation. If you uh, just devoted more resources to it, would EPA be able to evaluate a permit application, set source-specific air pollution limits, allow for public comment, and provide for administrative re review within a six-month time frame? Uh, no, that is not possible. Uh, what if you eliminated all administrative view, review? Uh, we still would need time to make sure that the permit was legally defensible and that all of the appropriate technical analysis had been conducted. What happens when EPA doesn't have enough time to do its job properly? Um, uh, like anyone else, we can make mistakes and those can be challenged and we start at square one again with the permit process for the applicant and us. Ms. McCarthy, as you, as you know, the Department of Interior issued permits in the western and central Gulf of Mexico instead of EPA. We have heard the argument that Interior issues permits in 30 days and EPA should be able to do the same. I would like to ask you about this. Does EPA require air quality modeling and use of best available control technology for every OCS source that would emit at least 250 tons of a pollutant uh, e per year? We do. And the Interior Department, on the other hand, exempts the vast majority of drilling operations in the Gulf from analyzing air quality impacts or applying pollution controls. For example, from eight miles on out, any source emitting 250 tons per year of a pollutant would be exempt from air quality requirements. At 30 miles out, a source could emit up to 1,000 tons per year without regulation. Interior set these exemption, exemption thresholds in 1979 has, and has not updated them since. Ms. McCarthy, can you tell us a little bit about how air pollution analysis and standards have changed since 1979? Well, let me give you one quick example, Mr. Waxman, and that is that, that uh, we now have a standard for fine particles, uh, PM 2.5, particulate matter. That is one of the most serious public health that we know of and is well documented. It actually accounts for tens of thousands of pre premature deaths annually. That standard came into being after uh, Bomer's rules, um, and they have never been updated to account for that. It is not clear to me that Interior's approach provides any meaningful air quality protection. Uh, another important difference, difference is that Interior does not allow for any public comment on exploration plans which contain the air pollution estimates. Cutting out public participation certainly saves time. The Interior Department process doesn't provide for administrative, uh, administrative appeals either. Ms. McCarthy, could you comment on the value of public participation in EPA's decision making and the benefits of providing for administrative uh, appeals? Uh, first of all, in terms of public participation, it is enormously important when you are dealing with a source of pollution that can impact public health to get the residents to understand what the project is, how it has minimized uh, any threat to their livelihood, and to understand the context in which the facility is operating. In the Arctic, you have whaling operations where individuals are sig spend significant time within range of some of these facilities, and you have to account for that. Give them an opportunity to be heard so you can understand how best to protect that public interest. In terms of the EAB, it is by far the fastest, cheapest, and most credible way to get to a permit that is legally defensible. It has historically been shown to be completed within about a five-month period of time, and only four times has the EAB decisions ever been challenged, and they have never been overturned in Federal court. So if you are looking to get to yes or no soon, that is the quickest way to do it. Will the gentleman yield for a, a quick question? Sure. Are you saying there is no comment on DOI uh, permitting? Well, let us. Uh, Actually, there is no comment on, on specific sources. There is, I understand, comment on a five-year lease on that is a very plan general exploration in Alaska. plan. That's they claiming uh, my time because it is about to run out. Uh, there is uh, no comment at DOI in the early part of the process where we do have it at EPA. The Interior Department model is what we had prior to 1990. Uh, Congress moved the authority to EPA outside of the Western Gulf because in areas with air quality problems, that model simply doesn't work. And I would note that this provision was adopted as a floor amendment representing a bipartisan agreement between Representatives Mel Levine, Bob Lager Marcino, Bill Lowry, 
Mike Villarakis and Billy Tozan, a, a bipartisan group, all, none of whom are still here. Uh, I hope that as this uh, subcommittee moves forward, we'll try to improve the current process, not turn back the clock. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. May I just ask one last question? If we were going to put a time limit, what would be a reasonable time limit? Because right now it's open-ended, and that's that's driving the a applicants crazy. Mr. Waxman, I, we're happy to work with you on it. I don't have a timeline in mind. I know we need to do it expeditiously, but I know that we shouldn't sacrifice public health or provide opportunities for extensive litigation where it doesn't currently exist. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that. Thank you. Comment. Mr. Shimkus is recognized for five minutes. Uh, again, I'm, I'm glad I made it back. Um, appreciate your help on the, the Prairie State thing, as I did in my opening statement. Um, and of course, that does segue into this because it is, you know, state of the art technology, and this is a, a big issue. And I think the frustrating, uh, Mr. Waxman's final point really highlights our why there's we think there's a need for legislation because there is no timeline. And in in the um, in your when you don't have a timeline and you're, you raise capital to assume risk, these drilling rigs, I don't know, probably even more expensive up in the Arctic, uh, millions of dollars a month or at least a half million dollars just operating before you even uh, all, all the other uh, costs. H how can someone make the business case for moving forward if there's no timeline? And, and, that, and, and so that, that kind of segues into uh, some questions that that ad address this. Uh, obviously, you have a great faith and confidence in the EAB, um, and I res respect that. But I think some of the conclusions are difficult for us to to accept um, because it and it, it for me it this kind of sounds like the indirect land use debate in when we had <laughs> you know how much. Uh, uh, forests are you going to preserve on renewable fuels and this whole indirect land cost? Because the EAB um, ha said that the Clean Air Act excludes non-road engines like vessels from stationary source regulations. They rejected arguments that vessels should be regulated as stationary source like California and Delaware are, are advocating. So the, our, our question is, who do you agree with, uh, the EAB or California or Delaware? And what do you really think the act requires? Well, first of all, I should have clarified probably when Mr. Waxman raised this that, that the statute does have a 12-month limit in it between complete application Well, I think that's his point. The final permit. There is so a there statute, is, there is. and then in, we're five years. No, no, we're three to six months. I think we're getting very confused in that five-year process was a series of changed well, uh, permits I and withdrawn permits. Do you, do you reject that 2007 was the initial pro start of the process? It depends on what you – well, I should Okay, I uh, you know, that. that's I our point. That well. yeah. Yeah. Um, but but le let me answer your second question. I actually think there's a little bit of confusion over the vessels. The, it, the way the Act and, and the rules require is that we take into consideration the emissions from those vessels as we're looking at what you call per, uh, a potential to emit, which is the amount of, um, of emissions from that source. We argued in the recent shell permits that you don't have to apply back to those vessels. The EAB actually agreed with that. But oh, if, unless you know, reclaiming my time, but you're you're saying these transportation vessels, you want to regulate them in conjunction with the stationary source review. I'm saying that the amount of that the the act requires that we we look at the emissions and we're from saying all of those the vessels. Ba the past past practices range. of EAB doesn't support that. I think that EAB totally agreed with the way we're handling it, and there's, there's no there's no issue remaining with. Uh, the I think there's not a consistency, the and that's part of our our problem. Okay. Now let's. Um, Let's just continue this process because this is really, does EAB help or does it hurt? We would argue that it's hurting because we're, the, the point is that um, is the EAB, you keep saying it eases litigation, but EAB is litigation. No, it, it, it prevents the need. Do they have judges? Court. Yes, it does. Do, they, do these judges they wear robes? Judges. Are there briefs submitted? Absolutely. But Are arguments there, heard? There is, yes. At times. Uh, or and I'm not a lawyer, but that times. sounds pretty close like litigation. It's an me. adjudication process without question, but it's a, a carefully crafted, very narrow, and one in which they have but, even but most recently issued a standing order to EAB narrow further. the EAB and your action has caused a ping-ponging of the, the permit, and that's where we will 
we can make, I think we can make a credible argument this has taken five years because it gets ping pong back to you, back to the EAB, the and then we have no resolution. Yeah. Well, this, the, when the EAB has remanded permits back as a result of inadequacies in those permits and when they have gone back to the EAB, they have never ping-ponged it back again in the history of the EAB. One bite at the apple. If it comes back to them, they have summarily dismissed it, yeah. and it is narrowly about the issues that they raised And I appreciate my time. I got 10 seconds left. I, I would submit that this case, if someone was doing a case study, they would say that this has been ping-ponged back three times. And I and I would put that into the record, and I and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Caps, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. McCarthy, for your testimony and also your patience in waiting while we had lengthy uh, votes on the floor. Um, I represent a coastal area in Southern California. This is an area that has some of the worst air quality in the nation. So I am rightly concerned, I believe. Um, there are 18 oil platforms off my shoreline. I am concerned by this draft bill that seeks to exempt certain emissions from regulation, especially in an area that needs to reduce pollution, like the area uh, that I represent and live in, and because of the jeopardizing of human health that is involved. You have suggested the draft would preclude the EPA from requiring OCS sources to demonstrate compliance with health-based air quality standards at any point offshore. What would be the impact of this pollution on the health of the people who live, not just those who come and work uh, uh, at, uh, on the rigs or on the, in the platforms, uh, but the people who live and work near and along the coastline? It would, it would clearly allow larger amounts of pollution to enter into the, the region that you represent and on the shore and it would then probably subsequently require significant amounts of more onshore reductions to account for those emissions coming forward. That is what led, us, led to Section 328 uh, to happen uh, back in uh, 1990, and uh, I think that we would see some of those uh, problems arise again. So in Alaska and in the areas of concern with, uh, uh, under discussion today, there are the health impacts to oil production crews, uh, but also to commercial fishermen, to recreational users, to the villages that dot the, the shoreline. Uh, and I know in the second panel, um, uh, one of the witnesses will be uh, the, uh, someone representing the California Air Resources Board in their testimony uh, with the same concern about if, if certain uh, pollution is allowed to exist offshore, then the regulations re will have to be more severe for onshore uh, in order to comply uh, with uh, severely uh, uh, strong regulations that the State of California has imposed for the sake of all people living uh, in, in, in whose air is affected by this. Uh, you know, I'm, all, I'm very aware of how failing to limit offshore emissions from OCS activities can affect onshore activities. Uh, in my district, emissions from marine vessels make up the lion's share of our total inventory. And it is not just the vessels transiting 